Good morning, everybody. Um, we, have a, we have a lot of exciting things um, happening here today. And um, I'm not here really to talk about demand, uh, that, which is the purpose of the conference. And um, we, um, the origin, this is, the, I think, the, the second year that the, that the Solar Plaza has done this demand conference. Last year um, uh, was, was the first. And it was really timely and, and, and exciting. I uh, um, remember the origins of the ideas and through conversations with Edwin. Um, about how important um, um, demand, understanding the nuances of demand were going to be um, in, a, in a world of, of where we have some amount of transparency into the supply of, of uh, 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 manufactured modules and components. And we have a pretty good understanding about where the bottlenecks are and where, how those are being addressed. And I'll address a lot of that this morning. But really the question was, is where was the demand going to come from? And it's a really hard problem because demand is so much a function of price. And, and, and in some markets, and it's so much a function of policy in other markets. So it really requires bringing together um, not, not uh, uh, smart people who, um, um, who, who, who uh, uh, can get Edwin to say nice things about them to, to give you an opinion, but really on the ground knowledge about what's happening in all of these markets. So I'm not here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to set the stage about what needs to be uh, what, what, what supply is coming on in the next few years? What are the assumptions that go into those forecasts? And, the, um, and, and so in, in some sense, laying the stage for how, much, how many modules have to be placed uh, when we, and then when we aggregate up a lot of the demand throughout the day, hopefully by the end of the day, when, after uh, everybody's spoken, we'll come back and we'll try to see where the supply and the demand meet and, and how it may match or, or, or depart from some of the charts that were put up this, the, um, already this morning uh, and what the implications for the industry going forward are. The, um, clearly, a lot of people think that, that, that there's a lot of supply coming on and that uh, at some point, supply's got to outstrip demand. Well, let's talk about the supply. A little bit about the Prometheus Institute. I founded it in 2003 after leaving my last hedge fund and um, um, started to collect a lot of data we bought. Um, I, I wrote a book called Solar Revolution, which is the economic transformation of the global energy industry. You can find it in the nature section of your bookstore. Um, I'm not sure why it's in the nature section, and it still pisses me off. Um, but, the, um, but, but, uh, but it's still there. Um, it's also being translated in Spanish and, uh, and uh, uh, Italian, for, for any of you who might want to get it in the next six months in, in another language. The, um, um, it's an economic analysis that sort of talks about the long-term um, bull market for solar and why 160 gigawatts per year, or whatever ludicrous number Edwin put up on his slide and extrapolated forward, suggests it's that, that it's actually reasonable and that the economics uh, and, and the markets can absorb that much and, how, what, and what kind of transformative shift that's going to be. Uh, between here and there, however, there may be, uh, as, as Edwin said, uh, a bump or two in the road. Um, but but, but long-term, we're all very bullish about, about, um, about the prospects. <clears throat> but it has to get to certain price points to make it, to make it really ubiquitous and, and, uh, and, and to really stimulate a lot of demand. Um, and fortunately, the manufacturers uh, have, have roadmaps to do precisely that. The, we write a bunch of research reports that Edwin mentioned. Um, uh, the, the focus of a lot of our reports within the solar industry are on where I think of as the bottlenecks for supply, the places that are going to gate the amount of available supply. So it's going to be um, at the polysilicon level. Polysilicon ha has been and will remain to, uh, the bottleneck for the amount of um, polysilicon-based uh, uh, modules that can be manufactured. The, um, the, on, on the thin film side, the whole thin film industry at the module level really is much more of the um, benchmark, um, you, the feedstocks aren't quite as important as the actual completed modules. So we do a, a, a pretty comprehensive thin film report in addition to our polysilicon report. We do reports on demand, we do reports on manufacturing costs, we do uh, um, other things um, in competing technologies like concentrating solar to try to figure out at what point some of those technologies may displace demand for straight PV uh, in, uh, in, in larger utility scale markets or even in distributed markets. So the, in this way, we try to get all the way around the industry. Each one of these studies is a real bottom-up study where we interview um, everybody in the industry that we, can, um, that we can get access to and estimate those that, that, that we can't. And, um, and, and so in, in most cases, we're doing hundreds of interviews per report, um, aggregating up a bunch of data, and then applying a, a consistent methodology to get to what the, uh, what the, uh, the, the, the numbers, the forecasts, 
um, and the implications are. The, the result of the, um, um, of, of the work that we do on the historical data collection, so it started PV News is a, is, is a newsletter that we bought um, uh, uh, and, and publish on a monthly basis. PV News has been collecting data on the cell and modules uh, manufacturing and uh, among other things for uh, about 24 years or I think this year or next year will be the 25th year of the data collection on cells and modules. So we've continued that tradition and we look at, the, at who's manufacturing. Typically we focus on the cell level because it's the easiest place to guarantee that you're not going to double count or get tolling operations or other things and you know methodologies are, are usually best when they're consistent. So we've continued to collect that as our, as our, as our primary data set to figure out what the production is. You need to, in all cases, be very clear about the metrics that you're using to go from cells to modules or polysilicon to wafers to cells to um, use DC modules for, of manufacturing to AC modules installed. There's all kinds of conversions that have to be done. In this particular data series, we're looking at megawatts DC of cells, or in the case where thin film, it would be the, the thin film module at the module level. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed data set, but that's the way it's been collected. And it's, it's indicative and it's, it's consistent over time. So um, what we're showing is, is that, as Edwin pointed out, um, so supply growth and, and, and corresponding demand growth has actually been uh, pretty strong and, uh, and in fact has not been as constrained by polysilicon in the last couple of years as people would have anticipated uh, uh, going into it. There's, uh, there's been some other um, tier two, tier three supplies of polysilicon that have come in, you know, things that were uh, in warehouses and uh, um, and, and stuck in the back of uh, manufacturing plants that have been brought into the system. Uh, there's been a, a rapid improvement in the efficiency of use of polysilicon and, uh, and some growth in thin film production, which has allowed the market to continue to grow at 40 to 50 percent per annum. Um, they, this, this industry really has, has, has shown amazing growth. And in fact, an interesting statistic, we just went back, because we have data back 25 years, um, this industry has actually grown 25 percent per annum for 25 years. Um, so it may not seem that big, but it's actually shown some pretty consistent growth over time, although there are a few years in there where things weren't as linear prior to, say, the 2003 to 2007 period that Edwin was showing on his chart. There have been a few wrinkles if you go a little bit further back. Prices have come down by an order of magnitude uh, or more over that period. So things are definitely moving in the right direction, and we're very close to grid parity. Um, uh, to continue some growth, but let's see, let's see where the production's going to go. You're going to have a lot of these slides. There's no way I'm going to go through them in any great detail, but um, you know, a, a quick sense of who the producers are. Um, obviously, uh, Q-Cells is, uh, is now the number one, at least at, at the end of 2007. Maybe on a run rate, SunTech has, uh, has, has beat them. They certainly make that claim. Um, we'll see uh, real soon how that works out. Sharp has fallen to the number two position. A number of old line e either uh, multi-jurisdictional organizations um, uh, or um, uh, Japanese com manufacturers have fallen down in this list while a number of Chinese and Taiwanese producers and uh, ha have risen on the list and First Solar um, has the, uh, um, the honor of being the fastest growing uh, um, uh, of the top 15 jumping in 2006 from the 13th largest producer to the fourth um, and, and I can uh, promise you they are going to continue to climb. The, um, this chart's probably going to change a little bit over time, but it'll probably still be, my, my guess is, is that a couple more thin film companies will populate this uh, and, a, and, and a few will, will fall off. But, um, uh, but the, the industry dynamics here, the consolidation, the, the, the top 15 producers still produce about 85% of the global PV, so um, that's not expected to change anytime soon.